All right. Yeah. Yep. We're yep. Good. I, I can go. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We're pretty excited for the uh, start project uh, open uh, house number two. Uh, uh, all the fellows are tuning in, so we're pretty excited to uh, start this discussion. Um, you know, maybe watch the videos to start and then open it to discussion. And I think Dr. Peron uh, will be the person leading us. Before he, before you do that, John, I just want to also welcome uh, Matt, uh, Dr. Martin, Matt Martin, Adrian Dan, and Dr. Stephanides, who will be helping us on the on the panel tonight. And looks like we also have uh, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Lloyd, and Dr. Eckhouse, who Great. joined. Full house. You, you can... Maya, do you want to say where you're at? So yeah, so uh, I'm in Pennsylvania, uh, outside Philadelphia. Um, so, uh, and yeah, I'm at the University, and I welcome all of you. We look forward to a lively and exciting session. Very good. John, do you want to start us off? Sure. Let me just share the screen here. And I will get into presentation mode. Okay. Can everyone see the presentation? Yep. Okay. So um, I'll be uh, starting us off with a, a video presentation of a sleeve to Sadie. I'm John Perone. I made sure I got the start logo on there uh, as the bar was set very high last week. Strong work. Very nice. Okay. It's nice. So this is a this is a 43 year old morbidly obese male uh, who previously had a sl robot sleeve gastrectomy and not achieved significant uh, weight loss. Prior to the sleeve, he weighed 360 and was able to drop 100 pounds to approximately 260. Um, Pounds. Unfortunately, he did have some weight regain to a point where he was uh, 324 uh, pounds with a BMI of 43.94. He said that he did still still feel some restriction um, from the sleeve, uh, but not as much as he did immediately following surgery. Um, denied any symptoms of heartburn, reflux, regurgitation. Uh, Preoperative uh, endoscopy was performed. Um, didn't show any evidence of. Uh, Hernia and the uh, sleeve was uh, appeared well. Uh, John, uh, do you mind if I interrupt you very briefly sure. not to ask you a question? Um, are you surprised by how this patient has done after um, you leave? It's not uncommon. You know, I, I feel like you know we have you know seen especially more so with the sleeve and with the, with the bypass patients. Uh, you know, tend to do well for a little while. And then, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, they fall off the wagon, they're not, they're not sticking to their diet. You know, we do see, you know, some weight regain with those sleep patients, uh, more so than the other, the other operations. What was his original BMI? Um, probably upper 40s. Uh, low probably 50. close to, yeah, I don't know, that's probably close to like 46, 47, maybe. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, yeah, uh, in preoperative endoscopy, no evidence of hiatal hernia. So uh, we decided that he would be a good candidate for a, uh, a conversion to a Sadie. So just a little patient background. He had sleep apnea, hypertension. Uh, aside from the sleep gastrectomy, he just had a, a right knee arthroscopy. And he, uh, no med, um, no allergies, and social uh, history is non-contributory. So, uh, John, before we move on to now that we're talking about the weight loss after a sleeve, mm -hmm. we, I'll ask you a question and we'll open it to a discussion before you move on to the Sadie. Uh, what's what's the data on sleeve versus bypass in terms of post-op weight loss? And how do you select your patients? How do you counsel your patients? And we're not going to talk about diabetes, heartburn, some of the other, you know, comorbidities. Let's just talk up about weight loss if we're talking about weight loss here. So weight loss for you know first sleeve, uh, you know it's estimated that you know you you can lose you know, around sixty percent or so of of your excess uh, body weight um, with the uh, bypass. You know uh, that's probably closer to 
65, 70%. Um, so patients that have a little bit more weight to, to lose, I would lead towards a bypass. You mentioned the diabetes, some diabetic, you'd see greater uh, resolution of diabetes with bypass. Um, and of course, anyone without the heartburn, you know, you, you want to make sure if anyone had a heartburn, you wouldn't want to do it sleeve. You would want to lean towards the bypass there. Same so who does, who does better in terms of weight loss post-op, uh, sleeve or bypass patients? Uh, bypass patients. Okay. So I guess the, the answer would be based, you know, what's the BMI? It depends on the BMI, right? So if you look at the, at the data out there, uh, up to five years, sleeve and bypass patients do pretty close. After the first like five years, bypass patients tend to do a little bit better. But if you look at the weight loss based on BMI, patients with lower BMI tend to do as well as bypass patients. So the simple answer is depending on the BMI. And that's why I think Dr. Stefanidis was asking you about the initial BMI at yeah. the index procedure, because you know low BMI patients tend to do very well with the weight loss post-op compared to bypass patients, but patients with a high BMI tend to not do as well uh, compared to bypass patients. And uh, one more comment to make to expand what uh, uh, Dr. Chal mentioned, John. Um, I was recently reviewing a paper for SWORD and I looked up some of the literature. There's some new pa papers actually suggesting that the weight loss effectiveness of the two is markedly more different than we've known so far. So, um, and the, the risk for weight regain is significantly higher after the sleeve. But I th something I think we all have known, but some of the studies have characterized this now um, compared to a bypass. So, so that's something else that's relevant. Now, I realize that obviously patient choice is an important factor. I'm not saying to criticize. I'm just saying that as bariatric surgeons, you should be aware that there's a... So the argument that many surgeons have made so far that, oh, their outcomes are similar, they're not, okay? There's more and more data accumulating that there's a significant difference now, for the individual patient, I have plenty of sleeve patients who lose a ton of weight, right? But as a group, there's a significant difference both in the amount of weight patients lose and in the longevity of that weight loss. Yeah, and to, to make things more confusing for the fellows, I think in addition to the issue of uh, weight loss post-op, um, you know, I'm, uh, first, to, uh, I want to say I'm glad you're using weight regain. You know, we're not supposed to be using... Uh, you know, inadequate weight loss or uh, weight loss failure, you know, you're using the correct terminology, weight regain or WR. But in terms of post-op weight loss, I think, uh, uh, you know, Monique is saying weight recurrence as well. Weight yeah, she's correct. <laughs> yeah, WR. Uh, but in terms of the uh, post-op weight loss, you also have to understand that there's some uh, patients who we call responders and some patients uh, who are referred to as non-responders. Um, so we've seen many sleep patients do very well with the weight loss, and we've seen many sleep patients not do so well with the weight loss. So and I think the million dollar question is how do you select those patients? And you know we don't have a we don't have a good way to uh, uh, pre-select those patients and find out who who's going to be a responder and who's not going to be a responder. So that's something to keep in mind as well. I like Matt's uh, new word. The recalibration. <laughs> as long as it starts with an R, we're all good. Yeah, WR. All right. All right. <clears throat> so um to the our setup, um, you know, we have a uh two left-handed technique um that Dr. Altra uses. Uh, we use here over at St. Luke's um with the camera going in the um arm three. Um, on the right side, we'll have a eight millimeter and a 12 millimeter port on the left side. There's an eight millimeter robotic and we use a 12 millimeter, uh, assistant port. We use a, uh, Nathanson retractor, uh, as you can see there, and that will put to the left side of the patient as the, we have the robot, you can see coming there, coming in from the right side, um, docking from that side. And we do have the patient, uh, with arms extended, um, in all, all across the board, standard setup, whether it's sleeve, bypass, eighty. I know, I know. We've uh, we've talked about two left-handed, two right-handed technique in the past. Uh, you know, this is a question for the uh, for the faculty. Are you guys using two left-handed or two right-handed uh, technique? Two right-handed for Sadie DS. 
Okay. What about the other procedures? Two right-handed um, for yeah. sleeve. I had two right-handed for everything. Okay. I'm left-handed to be all, to be fair. So I'm, I'm right-handed and Monique is saying she's using uh, two right-handed. Julie is using two right-handed. So I, uh, so I'm very consistent in the way I do things. So whether it's four gut sleeve bypass at a vision, Paris of June hernia, I'm always using two left-handed. Um, you think it's harder to teach considering most people are right-handed? Uh, no, no, actually it's much easier. We just submitted a paper actually uh, looking at uh, um, you know, our efficiency using the standardized uh, approach and uh, compared to uh, when we started doing robotic back in 2016, we tried different things, including two right-handed SI, and then we switched to XI and we changed the port placement. I think it's much easier. And I'll let John, maybe John, you can explain why we're using two left-handed technique on every single case. And maybe some of the advantages that we see when we take that second port out and bring the stapler in. Um, maybe you can so explain. Maher, I had, did have a question about the stapler mm -hmm. position. John, if you can go back to the previous slide, please. Sure. So I use two right hands, I'm not right-handed and I would never ch change to left hand, no matter what you say, Mahir. But nevertheless, um, the I've tried it. I do some of the bypass left handed, and I don't love it. But um, the I'm a little bit surprised with where you put your. Tw so I assume you staple through the 12 millimeter port, correct? The blue. Yeah. So yeah. So everything we do is um, through the 12 millimeter port from the right side of the patient. The blue, not the not the not the oh, red. The red is the assistant port. So we use that for suction yeah. or like suture. Well, the, the reason I'm asking is because that trocar is fairly close to the duodenum, or can be very close. So how do you manage? Don't you struggle occasionally not having enough space because that stapler needs a lot of room. So I put my stapler actually on the left side of the patient, because that gives me a straight shot, especially even if I do a regular switch, you can also do the JJ without having, I only use one. I don't have to change the, the position, but don't you struggle occasionally no, to no. be able to get the stapler into the duodenum? You know? No, no. Sometimes you have to like burp the port back a little bit, um, you know, but I see what you're talking about. Even with the JJ in small patients, like today we had a, a primary bypass and the patient was pretty small, low BMI, uh, and we struggled getting that uh, stapler in, but there's a few burp back, um, you, you should be fine. I have to like to go back to why this port placement, right? The big question is why. I think the one thing to keep in mind is that you need to standardize your approach and you need to do, you know, the same thing every single time, especially if you're teaching a fellow, because having standardized approach will make the, the process easier, not only for you and the fellow, but also for the entire team. So when we started doing... Uh, robotic cases back in 2016, we started obviously with a completely different port placement with the SI because we're using a hybrid approach. We didn't even have a stapler. And then slowly we changed. But when we started using the XI and the uh, 45 stapler and then the short form stapler, I asked myself a very simple question. Where do I want to staple my JJ and my pouch? And the answer was from the right side of the patient because that's how I used to do it laparoscopically. So I put my port on the right side. So that's the 12 millimeter port. The second question is when I'm stapling, do I want one hand or two hands in the game? And the answer was two hands. So if you look at my videos, when I'm stapling the pouch or doing the JJ, I have two hands in the patient. If you put two uh, a, a ports on the left side of the patient in your right hand, and you still have the stapler on the right side, the minute you start stapling, whether it's a JJ or the pouch, you're limited to one hand because the other hand is gone. So that's how I see it. Not true. It doesn't make sense. Unless you I have my I have my stapler on the go back to the picture for a moment. Unless you're putting two 12 millimeter ports, but no, if you have no, one no, 12 no. millimeter. So I put I put to give you an example. Okay. I put the where you have the eight on the left on the of the screen. I guess the right of the patient. I'm sorry. Yeah. The eight. Then the 12 where you have it is another eight. Then where you have the eight, that's the assistant port. Where you have the eight, the final eight, that's my 12, okay? Uh -huh. And and the, where you have the 12 red is my other eight. And this allows me to do everything without ever, the only, the only instrument that changes is that 12 uh, stapling port for the switch, okay? That's the, for a bypass, it's a little bit different, but for the switch, yeah. 
can do everything. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I don't do anything different. I do, I'm, doing, I'm doing the same thing on every single case. So you see, that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You need to standardize the approach to exactly you know, the same port placement, same approach for every single case. And that's- when The I only thing people, that differs between a switch and a bypass is I oh, change the location of the 12. That's the only thing. I put it to the, where you have it for the bypass because that definitely works better. And for the switch, I, put, I switch it to the other side. Otherwise, the trockers are exactly the same. So it, wait, it works wait, 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 wait. I don't struggle stapling on, on, the, on the right side of the patient having the 12th port on the right side. So Dimitri, where do you staple from? The right side. You're always stapling from the right side, right? If no, no, that's what I'm saying. I don't put a, a 12 millimeter trocker on the right side. I'm sta all the stapling for the switch, whether it's a SADI or full dinner switch, is happening from the left side of the patient. What about and a bypass or a speed? For the bypass, all the stapling happens from the right side of the patient. I only put yeah. one 12. Oh, no, that's good. It's good that you have a system, but your system is not very consistent. The difference between your technique and this technique is that whether I'm doing a SADI or a sleeve or a bypass or even a foregut procedure, I'm always stapling from the right side and I'm always using the same port placement. It's Chain very up. consistent for the bypass. It's very consistent for the switch. They're not exactly the same procedure, so I try to make the best. Shana, you're, you're very consistent. You have a, you're not consistent. I'm <laughs> going to uh, mediate for a second. Hey, John, can you keep going? I'd love to see your video. Sure, sorry. Yeah, I think my presentation <laughs> is trying to move on on its own. It keeps advancing slides there. Um, Sure. We'll get to the video here. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we start out, uh, going down to the, uh, terminal ileum, uh, and we do use a ruler when we measure out, uh, uh, we use 300 centimeters there. Uh, once we get to the 300 centimeter mark, uh, we'll tack this piece of bowel over here, uh, to the, to the, uh, teeny of the transverse colon. Um, now this was a revision, so Fortunately, the sleep part was already done, so we can you know, begin our section in the posterior stomach and work our way uh, distally down towards the pylorus. So we'll just you know, work our way with the vessel sealer and shortly come up on the GDA here. You can start to see it just about now. John, uh, you yes. uh, you did another one earlier today. So which board mm -hmm. are you using just to like kind of like, you know, direct everyone to your port placement? So right now, that's that's the uh, the vessel seal in four. And um, I think we're actually using two for this. I mean, we'll, we'll use one or two for the for the Cartier. Um, can't remember where this one was, but today we were using, I think, two, just because the angle was a little bit better. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, then we'll go to the uh, quote, uh, you know, the quote side of the of the uh, stomach there. Um, try to make a window, uh, take down the peritoneum, and have our landing zone for when we uh, come across uh, with the stapler distal to the uh, duodenum. And there you can see the uh, CBD that we're uh, exposing, making sure to uh, stay very far away from. So one of the techniques that I find to be very helpful with this is a lateral or retraction of the um, antrum up kind of anterior to the abdominal wall and screen um, right. Um, and it puts things on nice tension, counter tension, so that you are able to work two handed to get that view um, kind of consistently. Um, my two cents. Yeah. No, yeah, I agree. We actually had a uh, case earlier today and um, I made the same comment to John. I had him use the other uh, number one, I think this is number two and number four, but you still have another port that you can use on that side, number one. So you can actually lift up that antrum, like you're saying, and pull to the side lateral traction and bring that duodenum up. And then you can just go straight down and uh, do that dissection. Usually that's all you need. And then you're able to get a nice view posteriorly to get that dissection safely. I find it to be a little more efficient. 
Food for thought, pun intended. Yeah, I'm not sure how the uh, other faculty are doing the uh, Sadie, but I find uh, coming from behind the uh, antrum um, and going past the pylorus down to the GDA, and you stop just, and you'll see that in the video in a second, you stop exactly where those uh, perforator, uh, perforating branches come to the posterior wall of the duodenum. That's your kind of like the limit of your dissection, and then you transect. Uh, I find that pretty uh, reproducible, easy to teach, and uh, pretty simple. So now we're just going to create this window over here. Uh, you were when the stomach was lifted posteriorly. Uh, you saw that the dissection was carried just past the uh, just past the GDA, uh, getting a good two centimeters onto the uh, um, uh, duodenum there. We have our we have our window, and and um, you know I love to get the uh, you know, faculty's opinion. You know, in this video we used uh, actually a blue stapler. You'll see coming in a second to, uh, to transect. But today we 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 actually used a white, um, and the white seemed to be very uh, hemostatic uh, today coming um, uh, coming across the duodenum there. So what influences your choice, uh, John? Uh, just the overall appearance uh, of the duodenum. Um, this one seemed in this video seemed a little bit thicker. Um, I think you know traditionally we'll use white load across the small bowel. So uh, you know as we the one today we we're using the state the white load stapler more and more, just kind of getting a better hemostasis with it all around and uh, feeling a little bit more comfortable. John, since you asked, I'll give you my two cents on that. Um, I think it's a teaching point that you have to play to the strength of the platform the technology that you're using. Trust the technology. You want the tighter staple um, as that second portion of the duodenum or first portion of the duodenum could potentially um, retract. So why not use it? It will tell you if it's too thick. Mm. That's my personal opinion. If you were doing laparoscopy with a um, non smart stapler or no technology in the stapler, it's a different story, but you do have the technology. Yeah, so I'm a pro uh, Dr. Um, Lloyd fan and I use staple line reinforcement, um, particularly for this area. So I use a blue load. If I didn't, I'd use a white load. I like the staple line reinforcement, not because of the du like the duodenal bulb. I like it for the duodenal stump. It just makes me feel better about the stump. Not that I've had an issue with it, but I don't want to start. So I, are you saying you use blue with sink guard? I do. And yeah. then I um, cut the tab down anteriorly so it stays out of my way for my posterior row. And the kind of the wings that it has, um, I find it be really helpful for tension, counter tension when doing um, my first layer and my um, inner or my outer layer posteriorly and my inner layer posteriorly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like the idea. The, the question I have for you, do you feel like, because John asked me the same question uh, earlier today, because we like when we do a bypass on the first bite, we actually use seam guard uh, to prevent bleeding. And we use that as kind of like a, uh, like kind of like our posterior layer for the gastro J. And he asked me the same question. And I said, you know, I, I like it, but the, the issue is sometimes I feel if I don't have enough duodenum, Seam guard would be in my way to be able to make that your denotomy and do a nice duodenal leostomy. Do you have that same issue or no? I just cut off the I cut off the excess and it stays out of the way. Uh, so you use it and then you trim the uh, the wing basically. Yep. I trim the ring anteriorly and I have no issues with uh, uh, space. And I use the um, uh, the the not the ligature but the bipolar cautery, and I just use the cut on it. Mm -hmm. What do you use, Dimitri? Do you use white or blue? Uh, I always use white. I never use a SIM guard. I used to use SIM guard all the time, but I don't think it's necessary. Actually, it's more cumbersome if you put SIM guard for the way you saw it. It becomes a little more rigid. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think it matters, the point. If, if you're more comfortable using it, use it. But I really don't believe it makes a difference. Yeah, I I will admit I have no data that supports it, but what historically entrectomies and I realize a perforated ulcer and a duodenal stump are very different than a very healthy duodenum, but I don't like taking the risk. 
I don't want to deal with the duodenal stump. Makes me very happy. And for me, it makes me sleep at night, but that's straight up no data, just my sleep. What about Monique, Adrian? Uh, Matt, what do you guys use? White? Monique is saying white. Yeah, yeah I, I use white. <clears throat> yeah, I keep on going back and forth between white and blue. Like, so, like this case, I don't remember exactly, but sometimes you dissect that duodenum and it feels like very thin, like small bowel. And I usually just go, uh, like today with the white, it didn't even compress. I think it compressed once and that's it. And then it's stapled across. And sometimes after you dissect the duodenum, you feel like the duodenum is a little bit thicker. Um, and those patients, I use uh, blue. It only stops once and then it goes with the white. With the white? Twice. That's what we had today. It stopped once and then it went. Uh, but sometimes the duodenum, like you, you, I'm sure you've seen those cases where the duodenum is a little bit thicker. It feels like thicker, thicker than uh, your uh, average small bowel. And sometimes it's not. Um, so anyway, I'm sure it would be okay with one if you staple like a thick duodenum. I think you guys have all touched on this point. Um, the first thing is that you should do what you feel comfortable doing, you know, what you think is safest in your own hands. And then also, I think it was um, Dr. Dan who mentioned, you know, trust the technology, right? So every duodenum is going to be a little different. So usually I approach every case um, thinking that things might be a little bit different inside. I'm going to try to do things the same, but you kind of have to be adaptable while you're in there. So if the duodenum looks thick when you're dissecting, use a blue. If it doesn't, you know, use a white, whichever you feel, like I said, more comfortable with. That I would take away. Can we hear from the other fellows as well? Uh, you know, this is supposed to be like an open house. Please uh, speak up. Uh, do you guys uh, do anything different? Do you have any comment? Any? What do you guys do in your practice now uh, in training? Anyone? You guys doing Sadie's? Maybe you're not doing Sadie's. How do you well, say? I I do you do? Can I make a snarky comment? <laughs> The, now I understand why you use ICG, so so the ischemic duodenum looks good. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that's not ischemic; it's congested. Because without the ICG, it looks bluish. Like this looks perfect. Yeah, it so looks good. That it's makes it good. good. I get it. It's you know I use ICG knowing that it would be fine just for because of. <laughs> People like you making those comments just to <laughs> prove that it is well vascularized. All right. As I strategically paused right on that. Yeah, exactly. The ICG. All right. <laughs> so I'll continue. So uh, yeah, you can see we do use a uh, ICG there. Yeah, just check the uh, the blood flow. Um, yeah, we started there with a, a two layer. Um, you can see the posterior layer. We do we'll do that with a uh, a running uh, two O absorbable V lock. Um, you can see we'll make it the gastro um, duodenotomy and then uh, the enterotomy with uh, hot scissors, um, and then we'll go on to uh, perform the inner layer. Um, with a uh, 2 uh vicro, two, two separate 2 0 We'll start at the uh, three o'clock position. Uh, the first one uh, run along the back wall and kind of end around nine o'clock position. Um, you'll see come in uh, with the second. So there's that first uh, stitch running uh, along the posterior um, wall there of the, of the nastomosis. And then that second, with that second layer, um, We'll come in, uh, also start at three o'clock, and then we'll run that in the opposite direction and then rendezvous around uh, about 11 o'clock or so. Um, and then you'll see uh, shortly we'll come in with the second layer of a uh, absorbable uh, two, same same stitches before, absorbable two of VLOC uh, for the anterior layer. Um, and then with that very first bite uh, coming up of the um Outer layer of the two of absorbable VLAC like will we'll, uh, perform a uh, anti uh, anti bile reflux stitch. There's that uh, second uh, stitch coming in with the with the vicro. John, may I ask uh, how you size this? Uh, how you decide how long you'll make this anastomosis? Yeah, uh, so I actually. It will, we'll usually uh, perform this uh, over a 36 French uh, bougie. Uh, sometimes, I, same thing happened today, actually. We couldn't get the bougie uh, all the way down um, to the anastomosis. So uh, in this case, we didn't um, use, use an endoscopy, but earlier today we used an uh, endoscopy and tried to get a little bit wider than the endoscopy. 
uh than, than the endoscope um but yeah you uh, usually benefit, a blue sheet out is there any benefit of making it smaller rather than bigger i mean for the bypass we do make the argument to keep it on the smaller side for dumping etc does it apply to this procedure of making the uh an, an astomosis smaller i mean you had more room on the duodenum to make it even wider why do you choose to make it narrower it's a um it's so uh dr Bert, i'll try, probably speak a little bit better to that but uh, just so we have that uniform across um you know the 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 bypass and then across the city as well too um you know we don't really have any issues well, whenever we use the uh, the 36, we use the same uh, size bougie, we use Visi-G uh, in order to size for the um, for the bypass. Uh, never really have any issues with stenosis. So, you know, make that uniform. So we do it the same way here for the uh, um, Sadie. Yeah, I mean, to, to answer Dimitri's question, I'm not sure if I have a good answer, but, and I'm not sure if it matters because it's a post-pyloric uh, anosmosis. Uh, I have to say, though, I think I did this case. Uh, I can tell from the uh, uh, suturing technique. And John did the one earlier today. And his anastomosis looks prettier than mine, I have to say. So uh, kudos to John on that one. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think it matters. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of sizing it, uh, you know, again, the way we do this, the duodenal ileostomy is exactly the way we do a gastro J, which I think, again, to go back to the issue of consistency, having standardized approach, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, the fellows practice so many gastro J's on bypass patients when it comes to doing the SADI, you know, they're very comfortable doing that anastomosis because it's done exactly the same way. The only issue we have is to try to get that bougie past the pylorus in the duodenum. And typically we use the 36 French bougie to size the gastro J and we use the same bougie for the duodenal leostomy. But sometimes it's hard to get that bougie past the pylorus. So we end up using an endoscope, which is 30 French, the uh, GIF H180. And we just do the second layer over the, over the endoscope, just to make sure you, it's not, uh, it's not uh, stenotic. And that usually works fine. Yeah. So that was uh, the reason I made the point, John, that in this anastomosis, the size probably doesn't make a difference as it does for, for a GJ. So in order to avoid having to worry too much about it when it comes to stricturing or even constructing, you can keep it as wide. I, I personally try to make it as wide as I can. So I, I use 100%. a whole piece of the genome when I create the anastomosis. Big ass and uh, duodenotomy and size ileotomy to be similar. 100% agree. I, I also, but I'm also, I'm curious how many people pass a bougie to do this anastomosis. I don't I'm be curious to hear others. I used to use bougie for the GJs, and uh, I stopped using it after two fellows saw the GJ, the bougie on the GJ. Yeah. Cause you can I show the scope in too. I think it's also the trauma to the pylorus, right? As you're, you know, trying to get that down. It's so you know, so I just, I don't use anything. Um, I just leave the visage in the stomach, in the sleeve above my anastomosis and then just position it there, you know, to, to do my leak test. But I, I, I don't pass anything through. Shana, what do you do for your GJs? Is that as large as possible also, or is that just, uh, I actually, so, uh, for robotic bypasses, I do a linear with an overso. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm going to do, if I, to be fair, if I'm going to do a completely hand-sewn GJ, which I do for revisions, uh, usually it's a revision. So I'm doing it big. I'm not, uh, most of my revisions are not for weight recurrence um, and weight recurrence uh, sleeve to bypass is just very ineffective. So. Um, hey man, thank you for saying that. Cause I've been trying to. <laughs> swim 20%. Out. Yeah. Not a lot. I'm going to ask Maher to um, to reiterate a, a point that's that he's really taught me in some of these videos. Uh, Maher, one of the most nerve wracking things for me to do as I transitioned to hand sewn anastomosis was to make the enterotomies. You're 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 taught to never, you know, other than a small little hole for your stapler, never make a. So it's kind of you don't want to mess anything up. Get the back wall. Your technique of, if I'm saying this right bovey cut and push at the same time i tried it and it worked amazingly well so can you reiterate that for the fellows when they're doing that the first time by themselves next year 
Did you want to respond? You're on you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so that's a good point, Adrian. So when I uh, uh, when I proc to people or when I uh, I'm teaching a course, actually, believe it or not, even though it's a simple thing and uh, all surgeons are used to making enterotomies with the harmonic without any issues. Somehow, robotically, it seems to be a very nerve wracking thing. And so the one thing I've done, if you're doing a gastrotomy, your denotomy is a little bit different. And I'll talk about that in a second. If you're doing a gastrotomy for a hands-on gastro J, a very nice trick is to get that bougie down and then right. bully over the bougie. Yeah. And that would be, you can even do, do it with a hook without like that press, burn and cut. Yeah. Uh, and it works fine. It works very well. The, for the small bowel, it's a little bit nerve wracking. And the one thing I've, I've always taught the fellows is to open your scissors halfway, push against the wall to get some kind of like counter uh, tension, burn and then cut. And it's like a, a, and I usually have the fellows say, burn one, two, cut, one, two, cut, because they tend to either cut very quickly and end up with bleeding or burning too much and end up with an SCAR. So you press down, you burn one, two, cut, one, two, cut, one, two, cut. And, um, you know, and I've, I've seen the fellow like at the beginning of the year when they start, they, they struggle doing an enterotomy. Sometimes it takes like a few minutes to try to, and, you know, they're struggling, they're pushing, they're burning, they're cutting. And then by the end of the year, they're making that enterotomy like a pro. And it just, it's a muscle memory. You press, you burn, and you cut. And it's usually the, the uh, setting I use are four and four. Now for the duodenotomy, there's no bougie. And so you saw me uh, in this video do exactly the same thing. Press, burn, cut, press, burn, cut. Uh, and it works fine. It works, it works pretty good. I'm not sure what the other faculty are doing, but that's that seems to work fine for me. Yeah. Also, if you, um, I use, um, I put my, my cautery and, well, the cut on six. And actually, if you <clears throat> take the hook or you take the scissors and just tap, and go straight down. It makes this clean, like the cleanest interotomy, duronotomy. There's no bleeding. I mean, it's it's beautiful, and it's like very. It's almost like sharp scissors, like just cutting across with no bleeding. So, um, and I have my residents do that, and you know, and we haven't had it. Knock on wood, we haven't had any disasters. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, um, that little trick of kind of just tapping on top of the exactly where you're going and then getting in to make your hole. And then I think you're right from laparoscopy when, when we're doing bypasses, we're like, Oh, don't make it too big. Don't make it too big. Um, but now translating to hand sewn, it does it really doesn't honestly matter. So. Yeah. And have you guys found that the gastric enterotomy, the duodenal enterotomy, those are the most important ones because the, the small bowel will just, it will just but, kind of, you know, acclimate and, and fit to whatever you make the, the thicker tissue. That's one thing I've kind of noticed. What did you guys think about that? Yeah, I agree. I also think too, that the ileum is just super thin. So you just have to be careful to, you know, not back wall go, you know, going too aggressively, but um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, small bowel is super forgiving. Um, so I think you can just, you know, match up, even if it's a little bit bigger on the small bowel side, you can always make it a little, you know, you can line things up really well. And even with your suturing, you can um, adjust how far you travel. Um, so yes, I agree. You have to be careful with back walling. But the other thing that you mentioned, um, Dr. Hassan, when I do my enterotomies, I also make sure that the tissue is on tension. So um, I uh, forget who I'd mentioned before using the bougie. So I do that in the stomach side and that helps with tension, but also just kind of retracting it with um, my left arm. Very good. Now for the sake of time, can we, do we, we have another case, I think. Uh, can we yeah, go ahead sure. and... Last question for John, did you close the defect? The the shady defect? Uh, no, we did not. We did not close the defect with the shady. We normally do with the uh, with the bypass, but uh, not with the shady. Do you think it's important to close it or no? I feel like it's user preference. Um, I feel like the the recurrent trade is, is pretty minimal. Um, so uh, 
I think it's up to up to the so, surgeon. So Mike and me remember from his fellowship when I started out, my other colleagues were saying, "Oh, we're not closing the defects in the bypass because the recurrence rates are very small." Years down the road, everybody started closing them because they started seeing all the internal hernias. The same thing will happen with Sadi. Just you remember me in the future. Just one comment. I, I know Sh Shana wants to. Uh, her hand is up. I know she has a comment. Go ahead, Shane. I think it's litigious not to close them. Oh, come on. I'm dead serious. 100%. I think it's a big deal. Whether you're, uh, 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 I mean, essentially, you're, yeah, no, I think it's litigious not to close them. I've closed too many. I have too many internal hernias coming in, whether it's a true roux, a um, omega loop roux, or a loop. I think you need to close them. I think Demetrius is right. I think the data that has come out, which is more related to ruse and not loops, um, is um, which I'll present at um, ASMBS. Um, uh, further so demonstrates think, the importance. So the, the question is, do you think the incidence of Peterson hernias in those like- uh, Pseudo Petersons, because that's not a Peterson space. Number so one. Whatever you Number want. two, I don't think it's worth the risk. I don't, is it as high? Probably not. Have I seen it? Hell yes. Have I seen it more than once? Hell yes. Do I think it's litigious? Yes. Yeah. I, I agree I, with all the yeses of Shannon's. I mean, it's just, it takes a few minutes, you know, in the, yeah. the scope of the case. And then it's like, do you really want to be coming back a couple of months later to take this patient for another presumably unnecessary operation? You know, something that could have been avoided. And also when you bring them back, <clears throat> it's always in the middle of the night. Yes. yes. So it's always right. in the middle of the night. Yes. So come on, just spend the extra five minutes and then you can sleep three hours in the middle of the night. <laughs> and as you get better, it's 30 <laughs> seconds to a minute. Exactly. And if you're really lazy, use VLOC. Yes. It's not that expensive yeah. and it's yeah. really fast. <laughs> I'm actually an expert witness right now on a case like this. So please just close it, close it. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll say before we move on to the second case is that even if you close it, that doesn't guarantee that you're not going to have Peterson. Absolutely. You you're learned absolutely that from right. the bypass data. Absolutely. You're but absolutely But you can defend right. yourself. You can't say that about every step. You can defend the risk yourself. Is a lot smaller. I tried to close it. I close it. And the other thing, too, is that I, I do, you know, we recently just had a discussion on this, and obviously this could take an hour to have this discussion alone. But I think if you are going to close it, make sure that you know how to close it and you're not just being lazy and putting two stitches in. You got to close it appropriately if you're going to do it. And, and I think, honestly, if you're not going to do it, then don't be lazy and just th throw two stitches in. Just leave it alone, and then we can close it in the middle of the night. Um, so Shane, in the so middle. talking about Peterson, I know this will take an hour, but talking about Peterson really quick, maybe John can tell us about the John Perron space that he's going to write up like pretty soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure this uh, has been cited in the literature before, but we just the, the other day had this uh, uh, super Peterson defect where the entire uh small bowel in a, in a bypass was twisted, not through Peterson space. Peterson space was actually closed. It, it was above the colon, a supercolonic uh, hernia. Um, yep. And the entirety of the small bowel, the BP lip, many the times. Lip were twisted through it. And then just FYI, I'm, I'm closing Peterson's now on all bypass patients. But back in the days, I wasn't closing Peterson. And this patient was one of mine and she came ah. back. Peterson was closed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not perfect, but you can defend yourself. And quite right. frankly, that's the, I mean, half of it, the likelihood of it going above the colon is going to be low. The only times I, now that being, and I can't say the only times I've, recurrent internal hernias are super, super rare. You're going to see them in your people who don't make scar tissue or have lax tissue, like your low steeths, like your Ehlers-Danlos. Um, and, and those patients, it's very interesting to see what they don't form. And so on those patients, I actually always go interrupted onto the colon and above because I worry about it to a higher degree. Um, and then um, any recurrent internal hernia, I go all the way up and I'll interrupt over the colon as well. But again, you can defend yourself if you've closed up to the colon at least. So now primary bypasses, when you close your Peterson, are you going all the way up? To all nope, the way I go up. all the way up to the colon. 
No, all the way up to the anastomosis is what I always do every single time because the Peterson's defect goes all the way to up the mm. anastomosis. It never it doesn't say anywhere it stops at the colon. It doesn't, I and I don't. And I've thought about it. And Demetrius, I'm probably going to change. I go all, I all the way to the diaphragm. Vindicated. I just all the way to the diaphragm, and then even a couple of bites behind there. Now, I'm I have, probably going to change. I have to say, show us your technique. Is that the Dan technique? That's the Adrian Dan technique. That's a joke. That's a joke. I, I hate to say, I hate to say that, but I actually agree with Dimitri. If you're going to close Peterson, you want to go all the way up because because we've seen so many hernias through that space. Now I'm not sure if the I have to go back and look at the literature. Like the true definition of Peterson doesn't go all the way above the colon into that space between the remnant and the ruling, because that's another potential space. And that's what Demetri was talking about. Close it all the way it's up. It's one space. It. When you create it, it's one space, right? But the Peterson, but the Peterson, by definition, is the space between the mesocolon and the mesentery of the bowel. I'm not sure if Peterson also included that supraclonic space that we're talking about between the remnant and the ruling. Whether Peterson did or not, it doesn't make a difference, right? It's a big space. Why I agree. close it partially I and don't close it? I agree. Completely? And this, but I'm gonna call it the Perone space. Okay, so good. <laughs> Supracolonic, that's John's space. I don't know if I want my name attached to that. <laughs> Too late. That's <laughs> good discussion, good discussion. That was a great case, John. You guys are gonna make me think about closing that space after the uh, next time we do it, Sadie. Think We're just gonna it wasn't you. Even on my mind. It wasn't even on my mind. I had other stuff on my mind. This was not. We're gonna heckle you every time. Make Shayna to make Shayna happy. I'm gonna I'm gonna think about it. <laughs> My brain is exploding. <laughs> All right, second case. Good discussion. Who is presenting the second case? Oh hi everyone. Um, I'm Luan. I'm presenting a second case here. I'm just need to pull it up really quick. Where is Matt? Matt doesn't close Peterson. I didn't see him uh, say anything. He didn't want to get heckled. I know. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Awesome. Good evening. Uh, um, I'm Loan. I'm from Penn Medicine Princeton Medical Center here in New Jersey. I'm doing a robotic sleeve to uh, gastric bypass with uh, Dr. Yip Chow, who's the program director. We also work with another uh, bariatric surgeon, Dr. Lisa DeBruskin. So case-wise, this is a 41-year-old female with a history of laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, she presented with heartburn as well as reflux symptoms. Uh, she qualified for a conversional surgery and we plan for a robotic sleeve to gastric bypass. Uh, she has a history of hypertension, surgical history of a uh, lap sleeve uh, about seven years ago as well as two C, uh, three C-sections and uh, an abdominal plasty. Social history, she denies any tobacco or alcohol use. Her pre-op BMI at the time, uh, back in March, was 42. We did an EGD, uh, did demonstrate some esophagitis, a small hiatal hernia, um, otherwise normal sleeve anatomy. Uh, we biopsy the esophagitis area that was negative um, for metaplasia. Support so placement wise, uh, we do a uh, two handed uh, um, port uh, approach technique, uh, different from Dr. Maher. Um, we uh, put our uh, endoscope port in an uh, eight millimeter port right here, uh, perimbilical, um, and then uh, port one um, come to the right of the umbilicus, uh, and then port three and port four, the rest of them uh, lateral to the perimbilical port here. We do use two 12 millimeter port. And the reason is because uh, for the JJ, we like to do a, a bi-directional stapling for the JJ anastomosis. And then uh, for the liver retractor, we use the serpentine or the snake retractor. Um, and then we start off with uh, arm one with a caudier and then vessel sealer in arm three and then a tip up finish rate of grasper uh, in arm four. Luan, do you, do you guys use an assistant port? No, we don't. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody else in the call use an assistant point for side? Uh, um, as I don't. I use no. an assistant port on every single case. Uh, no. For different reasons, but I was so you close both twelve then. Yes. So you have two, two ports to close. Have you seen any um, issues with post-op pain? 
No, not really. We also do like a, our uh, a nerve block um, intraoperatively as well prior to like making all the incisions. Um, most of our pains shouldn't have really had much issues with pain otherwise. Yeah, just one quick comment. I'm not sure how the other faculty feel about this. It's important. I think, especially being in an academic center, we have like most of our cases are done by trainees. And I think the assistant port makes a huge difference, makes us more efficient. And it's one way for me to kind of like help with the case when I need to. Um, I can probably do most of my cases without an assistant port, but it's truly when you have a tough case, uh, you want to bring a suture in, take a suture out, bring a four by four, uh, you know, suction. Um, I think it does help us uh, be a little bit more efficient. Can you do a simple sleeve without an assistant port? Of course, you can do it with three ports uh, if you want. But when you have a tough case, uh, you know, a chronic ulcer, a large hernia, a fistula, a, uh, you have bleeding, you have, you know, you need more retraction. I think having an assistant port is, uh, you know, is uh, sometimes is a lifesaver. So that's where I take over one hand, whichever side. So on this one, um, I don't, there aren't cameras in arm two. So three and four, you're the, if you have a dual console, mm -hmm. um, the attending surgeon can take a hand and help with that retraction. That's how I approach it. Yeah. And I also, I mean, I, I agree with you about putting all those things in my, um, but usually for all of my cases, and again, I, I'm at an academic center teaching residents. Um, I put all my sutures and my ray tech in, in the beginning of the case. So I know exactly what I'm going to need. And if I need anything else, I can have my tech pass it to me. But. I, I'm nowhere near as good as Dr. Hassan. I can't put all of them in, but I do, I batch it four at a time. Um, when I do eight, I just, my brain breaks down, but I always put a cigarello in or cigar, which is what I call um, our rolled up ray tech. I plan ahead. This is very interesting. I mean, don't you guys at the end of the case have to spend some time looking for your needles and your... I attach them to the abdominal wall. Nope. I leave everything attached once I'm done sewing. So it's also oh. like a check of my homework. So I'm at the JJ of three needles, take them out at the same time. They're all still attached. Um, Peterson's come back, flip it over. I, you know, make sure it's all closed, run the rule limb, like all of that stuff, everything's still attached. So I don't have to go find anything. I put all of my sutures in the, in the, each corner. So it's all in the same place. Um, so I don't have to go looking. So I put them in an order too, mm -hmm. and on the side, that's going to be out of the way. And yeah. it's just super simple, straightforward. It's a check. Wow. Nick, we're, we're on a budget. I'm just going to be devil's advocate. I know you're pretty efficient, but let's say you go in and there's an unexpected finding, or there's an issue, or there's bleeding. You need an extra suture. Uh, you need somebody to help with suction. Like, do you feel like not having an assistant port can, um, uh, uh, de like delay? I mean, I've had, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, sure. It, it would be nice, but again, it's more incisions on the patient. Um, also I am, you know, you have bleeding, but that's the benefit of the robot. You pull your head out, you, you know, you grasp something, pull your head out. You have, it's not like laparoscopy where things are welling up and you need like an additional person to kind of come save you, bail you out. Um, so you can grab things and calmly, you know, pass things in, swap out one arm for the robotic suction. I mean, I've had those things happen, but, um, I don't think it makes me any less efficient. So, hundred percent agree <laughs> with uh, Dr. Hassan. Yeah, we should go ahead with the case, though. So. All right, go ahead. Please. Yep. Here's the video. So to start off, we uh, usually start off with an OG tube, just a suction uh, the stomach um, to compress it. Um, we started with kind of near the angle of his and uh, dissecting the stomach and uh, creating the gastric pouch. Do you guys always start on the staple side? No, we don't. I, I, this is my first one that I did several months ago. So it, the the sleeve itself was pretty dilated. So the attending was, why don't you try on the, the other side um, see, and see how you do. And then we started on the lesser um, curvature mm -hmm. afterwards, yeah. And you, you guys always do a perigastric approach? Yes, we do.
And then we enter the lesser stack and then uh, it's on our way through um, all the way to the other side. How do you decide where to start your dissection? Like usually, how far down on the sleeve? Yeah, usually uh, we go after, after the second vein at least. Um, we did have to take the third vein on here just to create more space because it just felt like that area um, was a little bit tight um, from this case where I remember and uh, it was pretty hemostatic afterward after we take the third vein, but um, usually we start after the second vein. This is, I, I have two quick comments. This is a nice video. Uh, you know, the one thing I've noticed when you open that gastrosplenic ligament, there was a couple of hemoclips. So this is something to keep an eye on because you can, your stapler can jam if you don't pay attention to these like large uh, hemoclips. And I've, I've had that issue before. So now I spend more time trying to pick those hemoclips before I staple. Uh, the other thing I do is I do, I don't do perigastric. I just go through the pars flaccida and uh, take that, uh, a, those vessels down and get as close as possible to the uh, stomach wall and then transect. A, I find this uh, easier, faster, more consistent, uh, and uh, I get a nice uh, straight staple line. Um, and I also always dissect, I'm not sure if you're going to do that in the video or not, but I always mobilize the entire pouch and also dissect the hiatus looking for hernias. I think I posted a video uh, recently on, on the RBC of Facebook showing a, um, a sleeve conversion to bypass where you know, endoscopy showed a uh, tiny, small sliding hernia and normal looking uh, sleeve. Mm -hmm. When I mobilized that sleeve, there was a large hernia and then a large fundus. So I ended up fixing that hernia and trimming that fundus before I did my bypass. Just something to keep in mind. Those cases, you know, you don't know who did the sleeve. You don't know how the sleeve looks. And sometimes you'll be, you'll, you'll end up finding a large fundus or a, uh, a, a hernia that's larger than you think. So that's my experience doing sleeve conversion to bypass. And this is becoming like, at least in our practice, one of the very common procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also, uh, did you mention Lone on your pre-op endoscopy? Did she have a hiatal hernia? Yeah, she had a very small one. Um, and no, we, in, in our practice, he normally, I guess if it's a small hiatal hernia, we normally don't go up and dissect uh, out the hiatus and uh, the fundus uh, on mm -hmm. sleeves. Um, and I think that's something definitely I think I may consider doing now in practice in a few months for sure. Yeah, so and then I would say, honestly, if you're, you know, if you're going to take on these, I, and, and again, I agree with Dr. Earl Chard, like this is going to be, I mean, 60% of our practice now is sleeve gastrectomy. We know that the patients have weight recurrence. So this is going to be a revision that we're going to be doing pretty commonly. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times I'll see on pre-op endoscopy, it'll say a small high angle hernia and I dissect it out. And I'm like, dude, you can run a truck through this thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then you're back a few months later with a patient who has the same GERD symptoms, especially if you're doing it for GERD, right? Or yeah you know, some, some sort of, you know, symptomology, not necessarily weight recurrence. Cause we already discussed that this is not a great, um, weight, um, weight loss operation, but, um, but I think for GERD for sure, sometimes, you know, part of your pouch will end up in the chest, even though it on pre-op endoscopy, it said it was small. You know? Yeah, so I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, especially as somebody who does a bunch of endoscopies, I usually try to screen all of my patients with um, endoscopy if their insurance will pay for it. Um, I find it's not really uh, accurate. And um, especially in patients who've had sleeves before and, you know, you're doing a revision case. Um, and worse, if like GI does it just completely forgets about it. So essentially I would say, you know, if the endoscopy shows a hiatal hernia, it's likely that there is one, but if they don't see it on the endoscopy, I still would anticipate that there's a hernia there. There's one there. <laughs> right. Absolutely. You know, and to, um, to add, to add to those comments, and I agree with all, uh, everything that was said, uh, we've also seen many patients with, you know, a sleeve migration for lack of a better term, like they have a normal hiatus, but the the sleeve it's a narrow tube and it slips up in the uh, up in the up in the chest. And you know the way we dissect that is the way we dissect a uh, a, a hernia. It's usually it's the left crust that's always an issue because you have staple lines stuck to the left crust. There's a lot of inflammation, so you end up spending more time actually dissecting the left crust. 
but the minute you do that, you, you, you know, the upper portion, uh, you'll see that the upper portion of the sleeve is actually up in the chest. So I tend to basically, especially in those cases, opening the hiatus on every single case. I find that the most accurate way of uh, telling if there is a hiatus hernia after a sleeve or bypass for that matter is if you do have a CAT scan, if you see staples above the hiatus. Yeah. Mm. everything else fails more often than, than this uh, tends to be the most constant go ahead I want yep thank you so we uh do a 45 millimeter sure form blue load over here uh so there's times when we've tried a white load before but her stomach seemed to be pretty thick uh thickened and dilated so we went with a blue load Do you guys all routinely use 45 for your all the bypasses or just specifically this one? 45 for all the bypasses. Do you use 45, Dr. Hassan, or 60? 60. 60. Yeah, I just use 60 for everything. I like to keep it simple. It goes a little fast, though. It's always interesting to watch uh, these cases, you know? I wonder yeah. who was anvil down versus anvil up. Yeah. Does it even make a difference? I don't think so. What do you guys do? I use anvil down. So anvil down. Yeah. I, I I put the cartridge down to be able to inspect the staple line to make sure that I don't have any problem with the staple line. But if there's any issue uh, where it's a tight space, I might actually uh, use the anvil anvil down to be able to get into that space. I have to say, like, I like how you dissect it. Uh, that pouch using that perigastric technique, but I'm not a big fan of how you ended up stapling to the side. I think you may have left like a large fundus, if I'm not mistaken, because I saw you kind of like going sideways, finishing that pouch. Typically what I would do after the first staple line, I will slide the bougie and I'll staple mm -hmm. the bougie all the way up to the hiatus. Uh, and I think you end up with a nicer looking pouch that's lesser curve based. Remember you're doing a bypass, the pouch, you know, people say it has to be four or five centimeters, the second vein mm -hmm. down. I don't think it matters that much if you make your pouch a little bit longer. Sometimes I make it on purpose a little bit longer so that I don't have tension if I feel like the mesentery of the bowel is too short. But it has to be lesser curve based because that's the least compliant part of the pouch. If you end up leaving a big fundus or large gastric fundus, um, then you you may suffer down the line. Heartburn, poor weight loss. Okay name it that's my experience with those so i was waiting i was watching the video i was waiting for that bougie to come down that's one way to like size you your pouch after you staple the first after you fire the first staple line bring that bougie and staple it across i think what i saw in the video you're going sideways and making your pouch yeah he um dr chow normally likes kind of have this angle of the, the kind of like a v-shaped gastric pouch here uh i guess it makes it easier to for him to like just do the suturing with the gj hand sewn aspect of it um yeah i um i i like i also do that v um yeah. but i still would go more out like yeah so you're 45 this angle that you're going I agree with Dr. Alchar. I would still keep migrating in like all the way up to the hiatus and dissect out that left purse. Cause how do you know that you don't still have more stomach up, mm. up there? You know, you don't have a big fundus. Um, and again, this is your best time to really kind of inspect all of this um, because, you know, hopefully he won't be back. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. And all of your anastomosis that are uh, hand sewn. Yes, we do all, all hand sewn anastomosis. Yeah. And I think normally for like a, like a, just like a normal routine bypass, we do more of that dissection and go into war kind of between that space, the left cruise between the spleen and uh, the hiatus. But I think for the sleeve to bypass, something that we have to work on there, just trying to make sure we get, uh, make sure we get all the fundus more and doing that dissection better.
Yep, sorry. Uh, we like to use like a 2 ethabon on the right side just for some retraction. And uh, for the back row, um, we like to use a 2 PDS Stratifix, just kind of anchor um, the omega loop up. Just taking some adhesions down here on the sidewall. I think I just saw your table motion. Do you guys move the table? You're moving the table, okay. Yeah, we're moving the table. Cool. We dock at 15, and then when we're doing our gastric pout dissection, we are around like 20, 25. Okay. And then when we're down below, we go down to 15 or 20. And we do use the um, omega loop technique in our bypasses. I think for this one, um, we did 80 centimeter up to the omega loop. Yeah, I typically do my JJ first, uh, supine, and then put the patient up uh, maybe 19 to 20, 21, and then do my gastro J uh, that way. I mean, I don't think there's right way or wrong way. Um, it just, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, um, you know. Yeah, in my case, the uh, JJ first is what I used to do laparoscopically. So I stuck to the same uh, technique. So I do my JJ and then uh, I go up and do the gastro J. I used to struggle with the SI because I used to dock and undock twice and that made me pretty inefficient. Uh, but now with the table motion, it doesn't really matter. Dimitri, what do you do? You're very quiet. I still do uh, the... For the most part, either the pouch first and then the JJ and then do the GJ or vice versa, depending on the case. Yeah. Um, I do put them at 12 degrees and generally I don't have to move the bed during. Sometimes you have to to get better exposure, but most of the time it works uh, well for both. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's easy to say you can move the bed, but usually my experience, it comes with some pain. Yeah. It stops, it, yeah. It, it clicks and <laughs> oh, uh, burp the arm and it's a pain in the butt. So I try to avoid having to move it, but at least you have the option if you need to. There's my efficiency for transferring four needles in and out by not having a um, assistive port. I think I, I don't like changing the table. I don't think you need to. Yeah, that's what you feel most comfortable with. Yeah. Um, we do use a uh, bougie. I think that's for this case, we use a uh, 36 French bougie. Um, we brought the bougie down just to kind of help guide um, our enterotomy or gastrotomy. What do you guys think of the uh, tip up? I used to use that and I I, uh, I stopped. I feel like it's too bulky. I do better with the cardia now. So every single case, it's two cardias and a vessel sealer and that's it. Uh, but I use I I think the one advantage of the tip up, you can use it as a nice bowel clamp at the end. But I stopped using it to run the bowel and dissect the pouch. One of my favorite instruments. Is it? I, I love the tip up. Yeah. Um, I never move it from arm yeah. four. I love, I, it's my constant arm for, love it. I don't know. I seem to be doing okay uh, with two cardias. It's just uh, when you have to retract a lot, when you have to get, uh, when you are really in the hard case, lots of fat all over your face. Yeah. This is one of those cases we're watching, but plenty of those that in my practice, that bigger length of that instrument can be very, very helpful. I don't know, Dimitri, everything I do is uh, is hard. That's my practice now at Evisions. And I seem to be doing pretty good. No, I mean, big patient, <laughs> lots of fat all over the place that yeah. you have a hard time exposing. Uh, that uh, instrument is very helpful. No, no, I see your point. Um, I actually have an assistant port also. I always have an assistant port. So when I have issues with like bulky momentum or something like that, then uh, I use the assistant port. Who is the assistant? Yeah, either me if the fellow is doing it or the fellow is I'm doing it. So the fellow does not sit in the dual console when you're doing this? 
So no, we have a dual counsel. So uh, depending on the case, if they, if it's a tough case and the fellow is doing it, I may sit on the uh, on the other side to help him. But if it's a simple bypass or sleeve, I may just like, you know, sit by the bedside, pass suture, and you know, help with traction and counter traction. And so we don't always use the dual counsel unless it's truly a tough case. Simple primary cases, the fellows seem to be doing okay without any help. What's your tech doing? Tech is chit chatting with me. <laughs> No, the Alone, tech- I like uh, I like how you made the gastrotomy just now. Um, the other reason I like putting down the bougie, so I'm like super obsessive about the size of my pouch. My pouch is always very small. Um, and I think, you know, I usually use uh, the vessel sealer to estimate the size. And I do go off the, um, the veins, as you mentioned before. But even when I pass the bougie down, I'm asking the anesthesia person where they are. And it helps me to double check and make sure that my pouch is not too big. Because okay. once they pass through the GE junction, I can check, you know, okay, where are you now? And then when I get down to where I'm about to make the gastrotomy, I, can, I just kind of confirm that it's five centimeters or smaller. Okay. So I would argue the hole is fairly small. The hole is small? Yeah. My, that's my impression. My, I make it at least <laughs> twice as big because this will give you strictures. Yeah, I usually, I saw what you did and I use the same technique, but I keep on extending on either side of the bougie mm-hmm. until you feel like the bougie is is uh, coming down with ease. And at that point, I pull it back and I start my anastomosis. So okay. I think if you're going to do a stapled, Anastomosis, this is probably an okay size, um, but hand sewn, yes, I agree with everybody else. It is. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I don't, that's a great point. I'm not sure if you're going to use a staple now or if you hand sew, but it looks like you put two, 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 two yeah. suits. So mm-hmm. I assume you're going to hand sew this. Yeah, she said all of their GJs are hand sewn. Yep. The other thing to keep in mind, going back to the pouch, I don't want to pick on, on, on the pouch, but and, you know, I'm, I'm surprised Dimitri did not say anything about the pouch because I know he's a uh, pouch fanatic. I think this is a big pouch might put you at risk for having margin ulcers. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little on the big, big side. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, I've had that issue myself in my own practice. Sometimes, you know, people with chronic ulcer, I, I scope them. I was like, this is a little bit bigger than I would like it to be. And, you know, sometimes people make the pouch a little bit you know, bigger for different reasons. Like maybe you have a short mesentery, you want to have a long pouch. Maybe you had issues dissecting the fundus and you went sideways, you end up with a large fundus. So just keep that in mind for the fellows. If you have a chronic margin ulcer, look at your pouch, look at the size of the pouch. If it's a large pouch, that's not, again, lesser curve based. You may uh, put yourself uh, at risk for having margin ulcers, which is what you have here, I believe. One other thing to, one other important point to make, um, in my experience is when you staple across, right, and divide the sleeve, mm-hmm. we generally assume that the end of the staple line will be the meeting with the end of the original staple line of the sleeve. But in my experience, that often is not the case. So the staple line ends up being somewhere on the top or in the back, meaning it, it's a, it may be twisted sometimes. So that can create potential areas of ischemia when you do the anastomosis you need to be careful about. Um, it'd be nice if I had a video to show you what I'm trying to say, but hopefully it makes sense. You see this also with VBGs. That happens a lot, uh, very often with the VBGs because they, they rotate. They're not always as, as constructed because of the scar that forms. So you be, have to be very careful about identifying where that other staple line is to avoid put any potential issues with ischemia, depending on how you do your anastomosis. Less, less important with the sleeve, a lot more important with the v- VBGs. Keep going, please. Yeah, so we do our uh, anastomosis um, with 2 Vicro, both for the posterior and anterior um, layer. Just bring in the other suture and go ahead and uh, tie our knot for the anterior layer. But
let me ask you a question as a fellow at the, at the end of your at the end of your training now um uh, are you doing it or are the attendings doing this video is that you how do yeah, you this, feel? this is me completely me <laughs> okay nice job uh how, how do you feel about the hands-on and osmosis is that something that's uh you know, you're comfortable with at this point, obviously. Yes. No, I think the handstone uh, anastomosis are great and uh, they're actually really fun to do. And it kind of teaches you if anything happened, then you actually can fix it with suturing. And okay. long as you line up the bow kind of where you're comfortable with, um, where is that? The, the both, both ends, you can actually uh, do a decent job with just uh, doing the handstone anastomosis. Now, in your experience, what's the most uh, challenging part of the bypass? Uh, when it's done robotically um i think for me right now honestly i think it's sometime the gastric pouch um which is interesting because yeah. you know i think that's something that depending on the patient's history and their anatomy and how difficult the dissection is if the stomach's a lot of more thickened or dilated um i think that can be a little bit harder at times yeah i'll ask i'll ask my fellow the same question i think i know the answer yeah. and i would love to hear from the other fellows as well yeah. because i think uh the way we're training the fellows now on uh, uh on the robotic platform is different than the way we used to train them laparoscopically so john what what do you think you know i, I agree with you making that pouch there's you know a lot of variability uh sometimes how thick the stomach is uh if you get posterior adhesions uh you know the way that we do it is like we'll make a little uh uh, opening uh, when we take down uh, the cardiac and dissect the, the left cruise and, and then going posteriorly and trying to make sure that we're in that exact same opening into that same plane. Sometimes we land a little lateral. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that of all the major three components, I agree, making the pouches is probably what I'm still still working on. Yeah, Stacy, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, chat box. Stacy is saying, Peterson, Closing Peterson can be challenging in high BMI. Yeah, I agree with that. What about the other fellows? How do you I guys? have to say um, that for me, it's the gastric pouch too, um, but it's specifically the furthest corner away when you're starting um, the hand sewn. And so um, we've been practicing a lot on um, uh, uh, cadaveric tissue um, with uh, the robot. And so we've started sewing from the center kind of out and around, um, which is much less confusing for me. So. Okay, uh, that's a good point. Some, uh, uh, so for Ishna, uh, for, the, for the question she asked, yeah, you Ishna, keep up, up, grab uh, across the roux a little bit farther away from the GJ and push it down to, to bend the bow. And then most of the time it won't go, th the air won't go through. By talking talking about tip up, I think the tip up is the perfect bowel clamp. You know, well, that's, I, the question was how do you prevent that from uh, going through? So that's that's what I do and works the majority of the time. No, but do you, uh, Ishna? Do you mean like you know you get uh, how to clamp the bowel during a leak test to prevent air from leaking past the a uh, clamp, right? Correct. You can use a tip up. Tip up is a perfect bowel clamp, or use a regular bowel clamp. I use a regular bowel clamp so that I don't have to use a tip up and pay for that. I'll just use the 12 port and I use a regular bowel clamp. I think Dr. Lloyd makes a really important point. The, uh, so when I do a omega loop, I then divide my roux with a white load and that previously fired stapler is a lovely bowel clamp. Perfectly across, nice and simple and easy. Dr. Lloyd, 100%. Tip up is what I use if I'm doing, I'll use a combination of the previously fired and a tip up for a Sadie. Very good. All good comments. Yeah, the stapler is a good trick too. Mm -hmm. um, all right, keep going. I'm looking forward to the, I want to look at the JJ.
Yeah, I see. I see the um, you know the with the sutures you bring. I know Dr. Hassan was talking about bringing your sutures. I think Shana does the same. I think Julie, do you do the same? You bring all the sutures at the beginning and then you take them out. So I do half and half. Um, you know, I was playing devil's advocate earlier. So usually I bring in all of my um, proximal and SMOC staple. I mean, uh, sutures first, yeah. and I do tap them to the anterior abdominal wall, and then. Um, I have a instrument exchange at some point, like, you know, if they're taking out the hook or removing the vessel seal and giving me the hook or something, then I just have them bring in the rest of the sutures. And I do reuse some of my sutures. Um, so like when I'm closing my mesenteric defects, I use the same non-absorbable V-lock to close both. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm very obsessive compulsive. I like everything to be nice and clean. So I don't like to have that many sutures inside, but I know some people are switching them to the abdominal wall, which makes it neat, I guess. Uh, and, um, you know, simpler. Well, it's not, it's not so much suturing, just tacking them in, you know, so I just advance the, the needle about a third or a half of the way into the anterior abdominal wall. And like I said before, I mean, I, I do have all of my patients standing up at least 20 degrees. Um, so the needles typically just stay up there. They don't go anywhere. Yeah. Now for this, for the, for the faculty doing Omega loop, I, I can't remember who does Omega loop. Do you guys take the mesentery down the vascular like that? Are there any concern about maybe devascularizing your rulin if you take too much or is that an issue? No, because you're not really, you're not really taking a lot. I do want to make a teaching point here though. Um, I have this irrational fear that that stapler, if you don't check, if you're very close to your gastrojejunostomy and you don't check back there, you could easily staple across your outer um, V-lock. So I always check the staple to make sure there's no blue in it. And um, I, that fear comes from having come close one time before uh, and uh, <clears throat> over so, and just to make sure, and the patient was fine, but just always make sure as you come close to your GJ that you're not um, infringing upon your uh, your various layers of closure. It would be disastrous if you did. So again, I'm going I'm to be a devil's advocate just to maybe have the uh, faculty comment and uh, open the, uh, you know, uh, make the discussion more interesting. When I do my JJ first and I take the mesentery down, um, sometimes the end of that like ruling looks a little bit nice, Kimik, but maybe you know, congested, or I'm not super happy about it. Maybe it's demarcating. I end up trimming it before I do my gas rigid to make sure I have a nice pink uh, blind end. Uh, if you do the omega loop and then take that mesentery down, just like you saw in that video, if you end up with that same issue, what do you do? Do you have to take the whole gas rigid down and do it again? I mean, that's an, that's a concern. Well, the first thing I would do is check ICG. Um, I know we we're talking about that before, but I would see if it really is going to look like it's well perfused or not. Um, but yeah, if there's a concern, I would uh, I would truncate it. And if it is going to compromise the GJ, um, I might even try dunking it, which is not great, but I would consider doing that too. Yeah, like, I've never uh, had that happen uh, where um, the uh, mucosa didn't look beautiful on an EGD. And what did you do? Do you take it down and do it again? No, if the mucosa looks normal, I'm done. Okay. So I always scope them, but I'm a big, I'm a big promote, uh, proponent of intra uh, intraoperative endoscopy for all anastomoses. Um, and if the mucosa looks good, I'm done. But I've also, if actually one side demarcates, it hasn't been the root limb. It's been my, I, uh, my JJ. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Loan, um, Loan, please keep going. Oh, and the other thing is, um, so usually if I'm doing Omega loop and I'm uh, after I've transected the elementary limb and separated it from the BP limb. Um, you know, sometimes I actually don't even take down the mesentery. I just leave it up there. If there's no tension and it looks fine, I, I don't do anything to it. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. You don't have to take down and, and divide any of that mesentery. Mm -hmm. You will still close, even if you don't divide the mesentery, you will still close the-, the uh, there's, a, there's a defect there without yeah, a doubt. There's Maher, you will not get me to say I leave my defects open. No, there is no. a defect. There are two defects. They need no. to be closed. It's like uh, the cartoon video with the orthopedic doctors. 
there's a broken bone I need to fix. And the anesthesia hypocena, that's really fun. Same concept. I love that video. The patient's in asystole. Uh, they have a fracture. I need to fix it. I must fix it. They're in asystole. That's the best way to think about uh, defects here as well. <laughs> exactly. Lauren, is that suture colored in certain places? Yeah, basically our two ethabon is a clear color. So we just color our ethabon just to kind of mark it, okay. make sure we know which suture it is. Because the Vipro is also the white color. So, yeah. I thought maybe you guys were making a ruler or something out of the, the suture. No. You know, I'm, I'm making We're fun. We're going with the video. Don't stop the video. We're, We're not that creative. <laughs> I'm yeah, making fun of the JJ reps that they create sutures that you cannot see in the open room. Like, what's the purpose of this? <laughs> I don't understand why they make clear colored sutures or because something. They have to dye it. Dimitri, it has to be dyed. What yeah. That An extra step. Uh, but was that 45 stapler? Um, yes, it's a 45, uh, 45 millimeter. Yeah. Are you guys, I mean, I, I think most of us are probably using 60 stapler. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you guys using 45 or 60? I'm 60. 60. For the pouch and for the. I use a 60, but I think it's important to remember that um, uh, at the beginning she mentioned it was a bi directional staple fire. So this is a nice wide JJ. So the 45 is a whole she different. She stapled once, though. No, twice. She stapled yeah, twice. twice. Okay, I missed that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the 45 stapler is like a completely different. So I usually just try to open one. So I, I usually do the 60 for the whole case. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And here's the, I think we're bringing yeah, the other staple in from arm four. Okay. I see. Yeah. That's part of why you have two 12 millimeter ports. So, uh, I know some people like bi-directional, uh, firing and seems to be, uh, one way to prevent like, uh, Kinking and obstruction and stenosis. I seem to be doing okay with the 60 stapler. I've had my share issues with the JJ, but the 60 seems to be doing um, seems to be fine for me. I also I also hand sew the uh, common enterotomy. I think that makes it a little bit maybe wider. When I do this laparoscopically, I will double fire. When I do it robotically, I almost never do. So why is that? Why do you do it different? um perhaps because of the stapling um i used to close it laparoscopically with a stapler um robotically a hand saw it so probably make it less um narrow it less mm -hmm. if you only use one staple load i think it's important for the fellows to understand that you will always narrow to some degree the lumen if you use twice uh, two opposite firings you will enlarge it so um, the question is, is the bowel small enough that you think if you narrow it a little, it will create a problem? Uh, and perhaps that should be your decision making, whether you need to do two firings or one. We're just overselling here again. Our common enterotomy with the Stratifex. Okay. Bring in our um, permanent suture for the JJ mesenteric defect closure. So I know this is going to bring back a lot of discussion regarding the mesenteric defect closure again, but Dr. Chow doesn't close uh, Peterson. He only I closes close to JJ. I close Peterson now. Uh, the this, this Sadie, uh, I'm kind of like on the fence. I don't know. Yeah. But to make Shana happy, next time I do a Sadie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that space and maybe close it. What? I will continue to be a broken record. <laughs> All right, nice job. It looks good. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ashar. Thank you for sharing. I think we have one more case. 
No, this is it. I think we, we only have two cases, unfortunately. Yeah, only okay. two. No, that's fine. That was that was a good discussion. Any uh, closing comments? Uh, Julie, Dimitri, Adrian, Monique. Would I, I would ask uh, the fellows if they have any questions about the whole discussion to focus our perhaps comments. Just quickly back to the gastric pouch again, Dr. Lloyd. You said you uh, normally make sure the anesthesiologist um, advance the bougie up to like five to six centimeter. Yeah. So um, I guess I'm using like three different techniques to determine the size of my pouch. Okay. So I use the crossing veins and I generally try to go below the first one. Um, you know, I guess in some instances, maybe I'll go below the second, but I, I don't think I've ever gone below the third. That's too far down. And then I use the vessel sealer. So the tip is usually about six centimeters. So I try to make it like when you have the vessel sealer, you should measure it and see exactly how far it, it go, down it goes. So I use that from the GE junction to estimate how long the pouch should be. And like I said, my goal is to make it five centimeters or smaller. Um, I try not to go much larger than that. And then as the anesthesiologist is passing, so I'm super impatient in the OR with anesthesia. So I usually have them part the bougie in the esophagus before I'm even ready to use it. So then I have them passing it down. And when they get to the GE junction, I ask them to tell me where it is, like what number they are at at the, at the teeth. And then I have them pass it down to the end of um, like where I'm going to staple. And then that should actually be less than five centimeters as well. So I have like multiple different points to check. But like I said, I mean, I think it's been mentioned here a couple of times too. Like I prefer to make my pouches really small because if you have a large pouch, then you have a theoretically a higher um, burden of acid and it increases the chances of um, developing marginal ulcers. And then okay. I do the same thing. So after, so I angle the first file up towards, I guess, the spleen. Um, and then after the first one is done, I actually do it about four centimeters. So I don't advance the whole stapler all the way across. Um, and then I have the anesthesiologist pull the bougie back, you know, whatever, as I'm doing my stapling. And then for the second file, I position the stapler and I have them put the bougie down. Sorry, this ends up being a very long discussion. Um, I have them put the bougie down and then I actually reposition the stapler to ensure that I have enough of the fundus out. So the bougie is down. I'm moving my stapler up against the bougie. I use a 40 French because that's what we use standard in our practice. I actually prefer the 36. Um, but whichever size you use, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that you're getting all the fundus out. And then I do my second file, which is um, usually a blue, but sometimes I use a white. And then the last load is definitely a white. And I try to make it half of the staple. Um, you know, if I'm doing two full staples then I feel like my pouch is too long. Okay. So to add uh, a brief comment, the tip up, the metal part is five centimeters. I use that to measure. The metal part, not just the jaw, the actual instrument, the mm -hmm. whole metal, metallic part. And and the risk is not theoretical, um, it's real. So the bigger you make your pouch, the more ulcers you will see. All right, any other comments, uh, questions? All right. Well, you know, uh, the one thing I would say is that, you know, with, for the fellows, you saw two very interesting cases. Uh, obviously, you know, that sleeve is now the most commonly performed procedure in the U.S. If you look at the MBS equip data, it's a, uh, around 60 percent or a little bit more than that from the overall volume. So you're going to be seeing tons of sleeve patients come back to your practice, either with weight regain, weight recurrence, and uh, heartburn, probably small hernias or large hernias or non-excluded fundus. So sleeve conversion to bypass, sleeve conversion to SADI, these are uh, two uh, uh, procedures that uh, will become uh, mainstream in the future when you go into uh, practice. I always tell the fellow, you may not want to tackle those complicated cases, especially early on, but I think sleeve conversion to bypass, especially if you don't have a huge hernia, uh, you don't have to go all the way up in the chest, uh, you know, you have a nice looking sleeve. Um, this is something that you can probably do safely in your practice. But again, keep in mind, just like we said, uh, the uh, a, most of those patients do have underlying hernias. There might be an issue with the sleeve. So you may want to uh, dissect that entire thing all the way up to the angle of his. When it comes to the SADI, the one thing I would say um, is that you have to select your patients very carefully. 
Um, you know, I know a lot of people are just doing sleep conversion to say to you whether the patient has heartburn or not. Um, you know, we're a little bit more uh, careful and we take an academic approach. Every single sleep patient will get a 24 page study. We didn't get to talk about that, but any sleep patient that comes, comes to our practice with heartburn, refractory GERD, they get 24 page study or a, a wireless uh, a probe at the time of the endoscopy, they get an upper GI and they get manometry as well because we've identified some uh, sleep patients with minor and major esophageal disorder. Uh, and, and if that's the case, you need, to, you need to address that as well. So uh, you do your workup, you select the patients that may benefit from SADI, and those are patients who have no heartburn, maybe a negative 24 period study, no hernias on pre-op endoscopy, those might be a good SADI candidate. If you have large hernia, maybe severe esophagitis, large, large hernia, uh, severe esophagitis, uh, um, you know, heartburn. In my experience, those patients do better with the bypass. Yeah, I think somebody with an acid reflux coming in uh, post-op bariatrics uh, deserves a formal foregut workup. Like and just one more extra point to make. Uh, my uh, Maher gave a great uh, summary. Um, don't, I think we'll keep seeing more esophageal dysfunction related to the sleeve. So keep that in mind when you make your choice, because if you choose the SADI, you want to address that problem if the patient has, and that's why it's important to check, right? Because the sleeve is a higher pressure system and the esophagus in some of these patients doesn't do that well with that higher pressure system. And that's what creates a lot of the problems. So check the esophageal function when you make, when you, if you convert them to a bypass, you'll drop some of that pressure. Um, not if you do a SADI or switch. Agree. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Good Thanks. See you, everybody. Guys.